Good evening. Many thanks for joining us for our first Paths in the Path Creativity is Contagious series. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor David Hawkins, Executive Dean of the School of Digital Technologies and Arts. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, this is rather a strange way of speaking to you, isn't it, online like this? We're getting a bit more used to this kind of thing now. What I'm going to do is very briefly introduce um, Associate Professor Dr. Robert Marsden, who is a, is a head of department within uh, the School of Digital Technologies and Arts within Staffordshire University. Rob is going to talk about contagion in one way. The show must go on. Um, in this lecture, Rob argues that theatre is evolved primarily through the creative endeavours of those who make it driven by audiences who have a need for stories. Sometimes this has meant circumventing the law and at other times finding innovative ways to make work. In England alone, an attempted ban by the Bishop of Lincoln in 1244, the puritanical laws of the 17th century, wars, pressure groups, plagues and pandemics have not stopped theatre storytelling. And they're not going to stop it now, are they? Which is important. Uh, Rob is also looking at the relationship between the live and the digital. Finally, Rob's research areas include rehearsal studies, pantomime, the director-actor relationship, freelance, and has been a freelance theatre director since 1999. I wouldn't get a part in his play, would I, the way I'm fumbling the signs at the moment. Rob joined Staffordshire University as a guest director in 2005 while still working at the New Vic in Stoke. And he's here now, and he's a rather good head of department. Rob Marston. Thank you very much, David, for, those, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining. I'm just going to play you something, and you might recognise this Gentlemen. Hi, Rob. As it buffers. Beats have gone. We're refurbing the theatre as much as we can. But all we want to do is to be allowed to open again. That's all we want. Sometimes it makes me almost cry to think that this is a theatre, and a theatre is about live experience, and it's about people coming and actors giving an audience an experience that that particular audience is the only, only time that that experience will happen because every performance is different. One of the things people don't understand, or it seems that governments don't understand, is, is that theatre isn't like a tap you could just turn on and off. It's not like a cinema where you can just say, OK, I've got the film, we've got a projectionist, we can project that film. Theatre is about hundreds of people who we depend on to give that life experience who have to be rehearsed and they have to be made safe. It's just not something that we can just do overnight. So good evening, everyone. <clears throat> the theatre and creative industries are in some pretty dire straits as our self-employed practitioners who work within them. I'm going to argue tonight that theatre has always evolved in the face of external events and pressures from pandemics to wars to political and religious interventions. And sometimes artists have circumnavigated the law and other times have been created within, with, uh, within it. And I'm just going to go to my slide and navigate this technology. Um, so I'm Rob Marsden and as David said I've been a freelance theatre director and I'm now an associate professor in acting and directing here at Staffordshire University where I'm currently also head of department of media and performance. I started my working life as a freelance theatre director in the late 90s and whilst my educational work now dominates I do maintain my industry links and continue to direct professionally although last year was the first year where I didn't direct a show. 
I'm going to be setting out tonight some of the current context and industry questions that are being grappled with, as well as exploring how education and training can support in these inquiries and how we can model different ways of working for students, building their creative capacity for resilience and change. Throughout, I'll also be drawing on some interviews uh, with theatre practitioners from my current research. I'm going to start here with a quote from Out of Joint Theatre Company's Artistic Director, Kate Wasserberg, who says about our current lockdown situation in relation to theatre, I miss those messy, glorious, unpredictable responses of an audience accompanied by the clink of ice and recyclable plastic glasses. I even miss queuing for the loo. <clears throat> And we'll return to Kate later as we examine what it means to be a live medium in these times. Lynn Gardner, in her opinion piece for the stage a couple of weeks ago, picked up a tweet from Scottish theatre company Vanishing Point, and they posed this question. Can a theatre company committed so far to creating live art evolve without abandoning live art, at least in the short term? A return to full theatres operating normally increasingly seems years away. So central to this debate is the notion of liveness. What does it mean to be a live medium within a digital age? Firstly, it's spatial. Can live theatre be theatre if you're not actually sharing a space with actors? Secondly, temporal. Is it still theatre if it's live and in real time but streamed on a digital platform? Is it theatre if it's recorded and watched later on a phone? The pandemic has meant that these questions are front and centre for the industry. And as an institution at the forefront of debate and grappling with these issues, Staffordshire University students should also be wrestling with these concepts in their own practice as practitioners and creators of the future. The latter half of my talk goes some way to discussing these issues and I offer a personal summary on this in my conclusions. You may disagree, that's fine, this is art. But what many of us do agree on is that there are more questions than answers at this moment as our art form continues to evolve. And evolution of the theatre art form is at the centre of tonight's talk. Playwright James Graham, and some of you may know his work, it includes Quiz that was on ITV over Christmas and This House for Theatre, says that theatre is people, not bricks. COVID-19 has meant that theatre buildings as we know them have been under threat and may continue to be so, at least in the short term, if capacity cannot return to full as venues reopen. What is not under threat is the basis of our art form, storytelling, as well as maintaining the liveness of the theatrical event. As Darren Henley, Chief Executive of Arts Council England said recently, COVID-19 has changed how we experience life what we thought, what we did, the way we communicated, how we were creative, and with adversity also comes creativity. And if I can add to that, how we make and teach theatre and drama will also have to adapt and evolve. Looking back at the history of theatrical storytelling, past resilience gives mid and long-term hope for us all. Many of my colleagues and friends from industry, and I know some are watching tonight, um, have had their livelihoods under great threat recently. 15% of the UK are self-employed. But to put this in context, in 2019, 50% of the theatre workforce were self-employed, according to the Theatre Workforce Review by Society of London Theatres and UK Theatre. Some have left the industry. Others are working with emergency arts council packages. I speak from a privileged position as one who dips his toe into professional theatre a few times a year. And um, whilst I've not directed for a year, my livelihood isn't at stake. But what I can offer through this role uh, and through the hat that I'm wearing tonight and through this talk is a macro look at some of the issues to offer some hope to my peers. Because as by October 2020, 7,442 redundancies have been made by of the BEC2 union members in the events industry. And in context, again, the creative industry has contributed 111 billion to the UK economy in 2018, and music and performing arts contributed 9 billion to this. I've been reminded often through this pandemic of the Mandarin symbol for crisis, which means both danger and crucial point, not opportunity, as JFK led us to believe. At the point where danger, 
and crucial points meet, creative, divergent thinking can occur, allowing for a continual evolution and ideas generation. I'd like to separate theatre as uh, watching or experiencing a story within a live context, a context with the noun theatre describing a building. The etymological root of the term theatre comes from uh, the Greek for seeing, watch, behold. Theatre as a term in relation to buildings in England came later with James Burbage's first purpose-built commercial playhouse in 1576 in Shoreditch called The Theatre. Prior to this, Burbage and John Brains erected scaffold scaffolds for theatre to take place in the of the Red Lion Inn on the outside and city walls in 1567. This was a prototype for the theatre and ultimately all of the Elizabethan playhouses such as the Globe. And here you can see on, on this slide, uh, the prototype meant that there was always a scaffold, there was a raised platform uh, of types, but there was a gallery for audiences and audiences were all around. In 1574, laws passed meant that innkeepers could not present theatre without permission. Hence Burbage's need to get creative and to create his own space for his company and gain some control. You may have heard of the apocryphal overnight dismantling of the theatre and it being carried over the frozen Thames in bits to create the basis of the globe on the, on the South Bank following a squabble with a lease. There's one innovative way to survive. In the Western theatre tradition though, my point is that theatre as a term in relation to buildings is fairly recent. Due to the fact that film, television and the digital realm simply was not a form, audiences always shared the same space and time watching stories. Leading director Peter Brook to state in his uh, seminal 1968 text, The Empty Space, I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty space while someone else is watching him, and this is all that is needed for an act of theatre to be engaged. Suggesting here the importance of spatial and temporal sharing. I'd like to take historian Hayden White's notion, though, of the past as a field of events. And I'm going to dip into this field and draw on some of these events to construct a historical argument to offer some hope for the present. In the first lockdown, there was an understandable state, uh, social media movement calling for, to maintain the theatrical status quo post-COVID out of a genuine need to protect jobs and livelihoods. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this relates to a basic need for safety in the face of COVID's effects on job security. And rightly so, when you return to some of those employment stats from earlier. Yet I'm now seeing calls from across the sector to think differently about how and where we will make work moving forwards. Now we've come out of the initial shock of dealing with a global pandemic. Graduates of theatre courses will be entering an extremely precarious industry, if you look at the cold stats alone. And we should be honest as educators, uh, uh, being honest about this will be vital. But equally vital will be our need to inspire students to consider what theatre is in current uh, situations, modelling and cultivating open mindsets and divergent thinking, and unshackling ourselves from any ghosted notions of what theatre sometimes traditionally is seen to be. Theatre buildings are often separate organisationally to the work that goes on within them. The 50% of freelance theatre workers often work for a trust or a charity that produces work. The buildings are often an asset of this organisation or run as a separate organisation entirely. Freddie Crossley argued in a recent article for The Stage that we must not be, quote, pitching individuals against institutions. Our strength as an industry is in our collective and collaborative voice. As an industry, we need to consider who and what we are together. Against this backdrop, there are many past examples of how theatre makers and institutions have, pro have proved to be creatively resilient. Professor Ken Ray, um, uh, he's a professor of acting at Guildhall School of Music and Drama in, in London, states that crisis does bring opportunity and talked to me recently about the impact of the pandemic on his work and posited three stages artists have been, uh, been through recently, grief, acceptance, and finally, opportunity. And he says here, 
The first stage is the grief phase of being constantly aware that we're not all in the same room, playing together. There's a great feeling of loss, sometimes even leading to resentment and anger, which is of course, which of course is distracting. The second phase is acceptance, accepting that we just have to make the best of this with the result that we start to find practical ways of making this work. But the third stage is the discovery phase, uncovering opportunities hidden in the limitations. Artists and students can take great comfort in this 3000 year old art form and its resilience and by embracing Ray's discovery phase and by standing on the shoulders of others who have unearthed many an opportunity, we can do so ourselves. So let's enter into that field of past events. The church's attempts to close or dabble with performance includes the Bishop of Lincoln, Robert Grosstest, in 1244, banning parish priests performing May Day and Autumn Festival rituals or taking part in parish plays. These stories still needed to be told and heard by an illiterate population. And with the introduction of the Feast of Corpus Christi from 1264 onwards, Roman Catholic processions spilled out from church buildings and onto the streets. The church had fundamentally moved its celebrations outside, and these processions formed a prototype for the style of theatre associated with the medieval mystery plays. Costume priests and choir boys used to take the parts of the biblical characters in the early to mid, uh, mid Middle Ages, but how could they perform Herod, for example? To do so would be flirting with mortal sin in taking on such a role as Herod or Satan. With the Bishop of Lincoln's decree and with the rise in church drama gathering a pace from 1300 onwards, different ways of rehearsing and presenting these stories were needed. And many of you will know that the guilds of artisans and merchants took charge of creating the stories by the late Middle Ages, with each trade concentrating on a biblical story apiece. The work of the guilds was reflected in the stories they told, with Noah and the Flood being presented by the Shipwrights Guild, for example. Let's jump uh, across the field to our next event, the plague. Here begins the plague, was written in some of the uh, parish records against names at the time. And with two to 3,000 people, and scholarship differs on this, packed shoulder to sh shoulder in these open air playhouses, the conditions were rife for spreading the plague. There were no masks on the door given out to audiences or socially distant standing arrangements in, in the pit. No health and safety executive rules and regs for pandemic safe working practices in theatre. Although we know that masks, plate, those plague beaks that were worn and poles were used to keep people apart in the streets. In 1603, 30,000 people died in London out of a population of 200,000 of the plague. Playhouses closed for 18 months. They opened and closed incessantly actually during Shakespeare's time as if the death toll was uh, 30 a week, uh, and the figures were released every Thursday, the theatres were shut. In 1592, the theatres closed for two years. There was no work for its freelance workers. Sound familiar? Historian James Shapiro argues that Shakespeare was the equivalent of a modern gig worker needing to earn for his family. So during this period, Shakespeare got creative and penned two major poems, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece, dedicated to the third Earl of Southampton, with whom Shakespeare had earned a patronage of, in modern terms, near on 5,000 pounds. Venus and Adonis became Shakespeare's first published work in 1593, supported through the patronage of Southampton. Whilst I'm not suggesting courting earls in a pandemic, you can see that out of necessity came a creative change of direction. Between 1603 and 1613, there were 78 months of theatre closures. Um, and if there was a plague house, doors were nailed up and a foot long red cross painted on the door with the words, Lord have mercy on us. If you were caught escaping from those houses, you could be whipped or subject to execution. I think I prefer track and trace. But storytelling continued. But it's not all good news. Uh, many of the boys companies folded, for example. But poems and plays were written by the writers at the time and, and the adult companies went on tour in the summer months due to the plague figures rising. Off they went into the countryside, or we've got evidence that they go into the coast, uh, to the coastline of um, Kent or otherwise, to private houses and inns. Now we can't go touring into the countryside, but we can go elsewhere, and that's into the digital environment. 
Next in, in the field of events is uh, the Puritans, the Puritan rule and the Puritans termination of both public and private theatres in 1642 to, quote, appease and avert the wrath of God. is perhaps the most well-known enforced closure from which the professional theatre industry needed to bounce back from. Following the removal and eventual execution of King Charles I, by 1649, the Puritans had gutted and demolished most theatre buildings. Others had their usage uh, uh, altered. It was the cockpit theatre, the cockpit theatre in London, it's, uh, I've circled it on the uh, left-hand side of the screen there, were turned into, uh, was turned into a school during the interregnum of 1642 to 1660, yet continued to stage illegal performances and was raided by soldiers in 1649. Although returned to use as a theatre with the introduction of the patent theatre licences, it soon closed in 1665. No buildings equals no theatre. Well, during the 18 years of the interregnum, literally meaning between kings, actors and playwrights created work that circumvented the law. Plays were presented back in inns and private abodes, and the form was reimagined as private musical interludes, operas and masks, bypassing the law to not present the spoken word. Sir William Davenant created a theatre within his home and produced the Siege of Rhodes between 16 56 and 1658, albeit to a royalist crowd. And whilst I'm not advocating for theatre makers or students to circumvent the law, the message I'd like to convey is that creative and divergent thinking meant stories were still being told. And what I find interesting here is that people continue to practice their craft during this period. Just going on to my next slide. And when King Charles II embodied the return of the monarchy in 1660, theatres re-emerged. With no playhouses, spaces were initially adapted for theatrical purpose. Artists as well as buildings had to adapt as actresses came to the stage. Leading actors such as Edward Kiniston, famed for playing female roles, had to retrain to play male parts, and not without some difficulty. King Charles II decreed, decreed uh, the Royal Grant of 1660, giving Thomas Killigrew and Sir William Davenant power and authority to erect two companies of players and to purchase, build and erect two houses or theatres. Killigrew adapted Gibbon's tennis court for his theatre royal and his company, the King's Men, and Davenant, the Duke's Men, at Lincoln's Inn Fields, an adaptation of Lyle's tennis court in 1661 both with a, an upstage scenic stage and a more pronounced downstage playing stage, all very different architecturally to that which housed the Jacobean dramas played in their wooden O's. Think of a tennis court with its halfway netline, half the space given to the actors and the other half to the audience. Yes, indoor tennis courts were converted into public theatres. People's need for the ritual of a story being told in the same space, the same room, had not abated during the interregnum. With a different architecture of these playhouses, new theatrical genres were born, both in terms of the plays themselves and new acting styles. But that's another talk. And the Licensing Act of 1737 in Britain was Parliament's way of agreeing and vetoing plays, not really fully abolished until the Theatres Act of 1968. And writers, producers and actors invented ways around such, sen such censorship. The Royal Court Theatre in London and the RSC at the Aldrich, for instance, turned themselves into private members clubs in the early 60s for certain productions, including Edward Bond's Saved in 1965, which famously includes a scene of a stoning of a baby, and thus circumnavigated the law by presenting contentious plays in private, as opposed to, quote, corrupting and attracting all the perverts. Yes, that, those terms, corruption and, and the latter, were used in written responses by the Lord Chamberlain's office in the 60s. Another interesting creative necessity has found its way into a genre close to my heart, pantomime. The spoken word was restricted as part of the Licensing Act. So the visual slapstick harlequinade inspired by the Italian Commedia dell'arte took precedent was at the forefront rather than a lot of the verbal repartee we might now expect to be part of a contemporary pantomime. There are numerous recent and current inspirations in our field of events for student theatre makers and industry professionals alike, 
to see where we can see theatres and companies adapting their content and their form out of creative necessity, sometimes without the need to present in a theatre building at all. Most examples have elements of liveness to some degree. Some are live in essence, and others have created work in a theatre where laws permit. The first clip we saw tonight was of composer and theatre owner Andrew Lloyd Webber, when, quite frankly, he could quite easily be in retirement, leading the way to explore how extant theatres such as the London Palladium could confidently support social distancing from the layout of the, audit of the, excuse me, the layout of the auditorium and considering productions without intervals. And Pantomime did open at the Palladium last year with Oliver Dowden, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport in attendance at the dress rehearsal in December 2020, prior to its enforced closure a few days later when London was placed into Tier 4. But other building-based production companies moved their work outside after the first lockdown, such as the barn in Sirencester and their summer barn fest, and the Watermill Theatre in Newbury, creating a season of socially distanced work. And producer David Pugh tweeted on the 16th of July 2020, it's in the uh, bottom right there of the screen, I am a theatre producer, so I should produce theatre, and so I am. And his production of Educating Rita performed at the Open Air Minute Theatre in Cornwall, replacing a UK tour of theatre buildings. Pop Up or Takeaway Theatre was brought to actors to people's gardens by companies and initiatives such as Bard in the Yard and Revels in Hand. Also, 20 Stories High's Knocking On in Lockdown, that's at the bottom left there, saw solo performances on doorsteps when conditions allowed. And these are just several ways in which theatre makers responded to the need for people to hear and experience stories in real time in shared spaces and for the theatre industry's love of telling the stories. When the Christmas season was under threat last year, Lingo Theatre created How Christmas Got Its Colour, where families downloaded, rehearsed and presented a Christmas story at home, making props from recyclable materials, generating costumes, rehearsing the script as a collective prior to a performance at home on Christmas Day, hopefully to their bubbled family audience. Sunset Boulevard was uh, presented at Leicester Curve Theatre over the Christmas period, Critic David Benedict stated, quote, since audiences are not sharing the same space as the actors, it cannot truly deliver the live experience. But director Nikolai Foster has allowed a different form to emerge, congruent with the piece told, with a feeling of liveness from the show captured as it was recorded in real time. The musical follows Norma Desmond, a fading star of the crumbling silent movie industry. And by using director dressed to camera, theatrical tropes were engaged, drawing on the piece's inherent uh, meta theatricality. Foster film not just from the stage but from the orchestra pit, the auditorium, and the fly tower. Choosing the locations within the architecture of the theatre that's loud congruence with the scenes. These familiar archetypes rooted the audience at home into the ghosted notions of the theatrical, yet still capture and radiate a form of liveness. I find Marvin Carlson really useful here. He's a professor of theatre at City University in New York. Um, his notion of ghosting, whereby the present experience is always ghosted by previous experiences and associations, um, and where an audience encounters something similar, but now in a somewhat different context. And unlike the globe players and the plague times, we had the health and safety executive issuing rehearsal and performance guidance after the first lockdown, how we could distance actors, use hand sanitizers, at sanitization and masks, and actors could bubble and self-isolate for two weeks uh, before rehearsals if they chose to. Props were being handled differently, costumes were sanitized, the list goes on, all adaptations for rehearsals. Yet these are the practicalities. Theatre makers also saw narrative possibilities open up if they used an open mindset and work within the here today now of the situation, looking at what was in front of them rather than what was imagined to be the case, what is imagined to be the case. Kate Wasserberg, who I mentioned earlier, said that director Terry Hands, whom she worked with at Theatre Cluiv as an associate director, gave her the best piece of advice of her career, which was to, quote, look at what I have in front of me, not what I thought I would have or hoped I would have, or I'm frightened I don't have, but what I have. The theatre makers who have adapted, in my personal opinion, the most successfully, have worked within what they have. Adrian Ferguson, Adrian Ferguson is a, a Canadian director living in Vienna. She directed Educating Rita for Vienna's English Theatre during August and September 2020. 
And she says, and this is a long quote, which, which I'll read. What was interesting for me was really thinking about the need for the characters stroke actors to be close together or touching on stage. Of course, it is always the case that you are playing with physical proximity based on the character relationship and the given circumstances. But with educating Rita rehearsals, it was exciting to start working from a condition of social distance and really search for the few moments where it was absolutely necessary to come for the two characters to come close enough to touch. Due to the nature of their relationship and the reservation and formality of behavior, especially on the side of Frank, character of Frank, it's interesting to see that physical distance between the characters within the confined space of an office was very easy to observe and created a wonderful dynamic between the two. I would be curious to see if it were not for COVID-19 regs, if there would be any change in Rita and Frank's behavior towards each other and the physical blocking of the play. And blocking is the physical relationship with the actors on stage. Or if they would still have to give each other space, like Frank gives Rita the metaphorical space to grow. I am thankful for the COVID-19 restrictions for forcing us to approach the play in this way. And I will bring what I learned about space and distance forward into my next project. Now I'm going to go on to the, the, the next part, which is around the exploration of digital and live and that relationship. John Claypole, who's the outgoing director of BBC Arts, stated last year after the first lockdown that the gap between the media and the arts closed, closed significantly. Even using theatrical terminology to describe the BBC as a stage for the nation during the lockdown. COVID-19 has forced the industry's hand in navigating the intersection between the digital and the live elements. And much research has been done, mainly in media and film studies, in relation to liveness. Returning to our field of events for a second, those past theatre makers would never have had to grapple with the live and recorded debate. But in our current times, we have to navigate these digital uh, platforms to negotiate the integrity of the live event and our relationship to it. Since the advent of recorded media, there has been a blurring of boundaries of the live and the media ties. As Philip Oslander argues, quote, television was initially imagined as theatre, not just in the sense that it could convey theatrical events to the viewer, but to replicate the visual and experiential discourse of theatre in, the in the suburban home theatre. Some of you watching tonight may remember ITV's armchair theatre from the 50s to the 70s, often adapting theatrical plays and their productions for television. Or the BBC's second city firsts in the 1960s and 70s. One of the uh, second city firsts was from uh, Peter Cheeseman, the director of Victoria Theatre here in Stoke, adapting his production The Fight for Shelton Bar which was a musical documentary examining the reasons for the closure, uh, the potential closure at the time of the steelworks for a television audience in a 30 minute adaptation in 1974. There was direct address to camera and that replaced direct audience address through monologues, and soliloquies. There was an expressionistic theatrical set. We knew we were in a television studio. Conversely, we have in theatre, as Oslander argues, mediatized many elements of our theatre. Think of all the theatre you may have been to, where we've got AV, projection, digital sets. We've got, had Ariel, uh, the character in The Tempest, uh, presented as a hologram recently for the Royal Shakespeare Company. But it still remains in the shared space with audiences. Simulcast started by the Met Opera in New York in 2006 and in, carried on in the UK with the popular NT Live platform, which are the live screenings of the National Theatre's productions, uh, and that was introduced in 2009, did not actually reduce audiences at the National Theatre's main venue, contrary to popular belief. Research in 2014 by the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts in their paper estimating the impact of live simulcast on theatre attendance, concluded that there was an increase in physical attendance at the London venue. But what about the regions, you may say? 
Well, embryonic research, uh, again from that paper and carried on elsewhere, suggests that there is also an increase rather than as uh, the National Endowment uh, Nesta describes, a cannibalization of audiences to local theatre venues in a region where there are civil castes. We have been forced to tackle all of these issues and debates head on within a few months, as opposed to over several decades. So it's all coming to a head, as well as I would argue, we should be thinking about what it actually means to be making theatre and exploring its very definition in a way that we have not before. As the Vanishing Point uh, tweet uh, asked in, as Vanishing Point Company asked in their tweet that we saw at the beginning. But as alluded to earlier, I think there's a distinction for me between one, the pure live event. We're in a theatre, we're sharing space, we're sharing time. Two, the recorded event, where I may, I may be sharing the space with my family at home, but I'm not actually sharing that space with the performers. And three, the mediatized live streamed event, that you might be watching something live and you're sharing time, but you're not sharing the same space. But the nevertheless may be a liveness to it. An actor may go wrong, drop a prop. I think there's a big element of why audiences love the theater um, sometimes they're excited to see what might happen on that night. So how have theatre makers been doing all of this practically? Out of necessity, companies have not moved to the countryside or to the coast, as we, we looked at earlier, as Shakespeare's players once did, but to old and new media forms, such as television or social media platforms. In The Runaway Species, How Human Creativity Remakes the World, Anthony Brandt and David Eagleman posit that we refashion the world with continual creativity and innovative thinking. Um, they posit um, three themes, bending, blending and breaking. Bending, where an original is modified or twisted out of shape. Breaking, where a whole is taken apart, so something new is made out of the pieces and at times they can remain separate or blending, where two or more sources are, are merged. By being in their terms overtly creative and being aware of creative processes and how we can harness them, innovation is nurtured, incubated and developed, as opposed to hoping for some kind of eureka light bulb moment. And throughout the pandemic, we have been blending the live and the mediatized, allowing a digital, allowing for a theatrical sense of liveness to burst through our screens, tablets, phones. Socially distanced live performances have been achieved through bending the form into something very similar but different. Its uncanniness means it has a familiarity. So let's take a look at some of the examples of work that's been taking place in lockdown. You have to bear with me as I am. Um, as I explore my, my uh, presentation here. This is Polka Theatre's uh, Christmas Carol. Some of these are quite quiet, but I'll just play little bits of them so you get a, get a glimpse. This was, uh, uh, people were all working somewhat in isolation where the designers were creating work that was sent over to the home of the performer who lived with the stage manager. So there's, there's a whole way of thinking differently about making work for children here that I'd like to uh, present. I'm just going to try getting into this. Scrooge ran inside in fear and lit a candle trying to warm himself around the tiny flame as he heard chains dragging and jangling up his stairs. Scrooge, take up Marley. Yes, Scrooge, your long dead business partner, Shake of Marley. What is this terrible chain you wear? I forged this chain in life through my acts of greed and cruelty. But is it theatre? It's recorded, it has a liveness, it's got loads of theatrical tropes, the proscenium arch there and so on. But is it actually theatre? It's recorded and played later. The next one I'm going to go to. 
bear with me a second. I wanted to mention, I wanted to mention Tamasha's interactive immersive headphone promenade show. The audiences had headphones and they were cast in role as adventurers. The actors were recorded telling stories uh, from their location. I'm just going to try playing this and So, um, the actual recorded, uh, but is it theatre? It's theatrical. The next uh, example I'd like to show is a piece of verbatim theatre created by Talua Theatre, where real words of real people are used to create a story, including all the idiosyncratic tics of vocal delivery, like ums and ahs, for example. Let's have a quick look at a tiny bit of this. situation we're in now to think back to September because that was like pre-COVID, pre-Black Lives Matter, pre all the things that's going on now. Yeah, it was after Christmas, wasn't it? We were talking about what was going on in China and we were like told at the school, yes, to discuss it, but not to discuss it amongst ourselves and stuff in front of the kids because of the nature of the kids we teach. So you want the people so it's verbatim theatre with actors uh, 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 as a vessel for the words. But is it theatre? It's a theatre company, but is it theatre? It uses theatre making techniques, but so did Mike Lee uh, when he moved his improvisatory techniques of making work from theatre to film. But we don't call his TV and film work theatre. I argue that this, this is a film. And these examples, returning to Oslander, are a reflection of this question. Are there really clear cut distinctions between live forms and mediatized ones? And that was in 1999. Supporting his call to break down the, quote, reductive binary opposition of the live and the mediatized. And our students at Staffordshire have been uh, stimulated to think and create theatre and performance for our current age, as opposed to previous ones, by drawing on the spirit of ghosted conventions as opposed to the letter, working within the theatrical and to capture the liveness of what theatre can bring. These examples, all of these examples, teach us how practice is continually altered uh, from the industry examples and we need to model that. I can't show you a clip of this, but I'm going to, um, apparently I can put this online and share this later um, because the sound doesn't work. But in, in the first lockdown, we were about to go into a, a whole uh, series of classical um, play uh, presentations in our studios here. Um, and, but we work congruently within the digital platform. Rehearsed as we rehearsed as we may rehearse a play. And then we work within, a bit like staged, <laughs> we work within this, uh, using the Zoom uh, platform. And it's not theatre but we used a lot of theatrical techniques. And in this clip, which um, I can't, uh, the sound's really slow, but I'll just play a little bit in the background. We've got two characters here catch, snatching a quick moment where they're discussing a, a really high level um, issue on using Zoom. We set it in, in 2020. It's got a liveness, it's got a theatrical energy, recorded in real time. We didn't do lots of short takes and edited together. It was recorded in, with one take. So we used acting and theatre training techniques in a digital rehearsal environment. But again, it was watched later, so I wouldn't class it necessarily as, as theatre. So the point is, theatre makers for generations have adapted, bent, blended and broken stuff up, repackaged it in order to evolve and ultimately, uh, ultimately survive and therefore evolution occurs. So we evolve in the ways we tell our stories. We need to empower theatre organisations and our future practitioners to explore explicitly what it means to be creative, to upskill, think differently, 
let's explore how to create. And the expectation of the relationship between live and digital is shifting rapidly. In October 2020, Associate Editor of the Stage, Lynn Gardner, stated, quote, the live and the digital will always be different from each other, describing a different experience of the Chichester Festival Theatre production of Sarah Kane's Crave, whereby a home audience watched the simulcast of the live production. Yet by December 2020, Gardner stated that, quote, the future of theatre is live and digital, but not offering what that form might take, just saying provocatively, watch this space. And watch this space here at the university too. Our newly, newly formed media and performance department is now blurring the live and digital edges, allowing students to build resilience, creative thinking and innovative skill sets. Being at the forefront of knowledge creation also means keep, keeping a close eye on the professional theatre world to see what's happening there and examine uh, endeavours and possibilities and for the theatre industry to look to us too. So let's introduce students to the basics of storytelling if we do not do so already. Following a day's walk with his family, actor Mark Rylance was reminded of the roots of storytelling in relation to a circle that naturally created itself around the fire at night. And his quote is here. The center is where the heat and that center is where the heat is and that heat spreads to each walker sat around in a circle as do the stories of the day's sights, the jokes, hopes and remembrances, the songs and sometimes the dance. There is a shared experience. Someone contributes to the story. And I love this bit. Just as someone contributes logs to the fire, the fire and the story both share the center. By placing the fire of the story at the center of things, as storytellers, we can find the form most appropriate to tell it. With this deeper critical understanding, we can begin to make our work informed by this. Take the story, then find the form. To return to my earlier point, early, uh, to return to my earlier point, theatre can only truly exist for me where there is a shared space and time between actor and audience. Students should grapple with the notions of what is meant by the live. And for me, a recorded version of a theatre piece played at a later time simply is not theatre. It is a recording of that story with the trappings of liveness, as Andrew Cassell argues, that we need to be careful of. It is an act of repetition, as Jacques Attili argued in 1985. It was recorded and then could be played again, repeated and consumed in that way. Chrysal also argues that television and radio can never truly be live, as they may provide, quote, co-presence in time, but they cannot provide co-presence in space. Alive means, for me, in theatre terms, sharing time and space. But the live can simply mean sharing space. So there can be a live stream of a of a national theatre production, sorry, just sharing time, whereby there are elements of liveness. But I believe it's in the co-presence that's going to be important for theatre moving forward, whether in an actual traditional theatre building or not. And it's what we'll probably come to value more than ever in a post-COVID world, with our forms, that, with the form that blurs the live and the recorded. But through co-presence, we can be part of that wider community. Chriselle argues that we always hanker after liveness or shared events. That's why we go on social media. We want an instant response to our tweets or the need even to watch cinema. It's a recorded event, but we need to share that with other people in a shared space. And remember the images of in the UK, the nights and days after the first lockdown lift, put a few on the screen now. Restaurants, beaches and bars were full. I'm not advocating what's happening in these pictures. My point is, is that we craved communal contact. We need to share, we need, need, needed to share time and space. And theatre makers I've spoken to recently echo the need for the communal nature of theatre as well. Teresa Heskins, the artistic director of the New Vic Theatre here in Staffordshire says, our leisure activity is personalised and our consumption is individual. Theatre is an important place to come together to create a community, asking us to think about ourselves in relation to other people. And in Theatre in the Round, the New Vic Theatre here in Newcastle under Lyme is in the Round, your backdrop is made up of other members of your community. Every play that you watch is about other people, so that informs it. 
Belgian Theatre Director Eva van Hove states, we now crave seeing live human beings in the art form which theatre can deliver. We have delivered this for centuries and will go on doing so. People will crave getting away from computers and televisions and need to see a live person, a thing that's actually there, people telling stories, actually there in front of your eyes. This will be the greatest attraction. Theatre should answer questions about our lives and a live human being telling a story in front of our eyes, that will be of real value in the 21st century. Finding our opportunity for shared space will be vital, regardless of the physical space. For Michelle Terry, Artistic Director of The Globe, this sharing is at the centre of her definition of theatre, as the form is, quote, the opposite of isolationism. It can only be done collectively. And as Richard Eyre states, quote, you go into a space as individuals, and if it works, in the end, you become a group, a society. We will be in a shared space again, experiencing theatre. And this year I'm expected to be directing pantomime for in Halifax for Imagine Theatre. And I hope I can introduce baby Emily to a live event. And here are some of my past productions or from Imagine uh, Theatre here. You may spot a staff uni colleague playing Damon Halifax in one of these picks. Panto. This is my kind of final point tonight, really. It's a deliciously anarchic art form wherein the audience is actually the final character of the story with genuine dialogue between audiences and performers sharing space and time. Online live pantomime has been an absolutely brilliant creative endeavor as a stopgap, but the anarchic energy of comedy, slapstick, spectacle and music can only be viscerally sensed collectively, even though a simulcast can radiate some of the theatrical energy. I argue that actually stops being a pantomime without that spatial engagement. Online recorded versions like Dick Whittington at the National Theatre uh, 2020 was for me a, a, a brilliant documentation, but that's what it was, a documentation of a theatrical event. It was essentially archive footage of that particular performance. And performance, that performance would have changed over its final few shows from when it was recorded, which again, finds theatre, it can evolve, it beds in, it develops, it starts to have its own life. Therefore, we can share the theatrical event through time, as theatre is about the watching. And whilst I've argued this may not relate to a piece in an actual theatre building, theatre within a digital platform should, I think, embrace the element of the live and find a way to embrace an element of the live and not just liveness. And the, past, the field of past events that we entered into revealed the resilience and creative innovation of the theatrical art form. So the show will go on. And maybe as with the restoration, we'll need new buildings. Last week, the Vertical Theatre Group unveiled their plans for a new touring pop-up theatre with socially distanced pods for audiences, uh, for audiences uh, to quote their quote, to future-proof the theatrical event. So, just to conclude now, I return to uh, Darren Henley, who says, quote, the COVID restrictions also showed us the significance of our humanity and of our social interaction, and to the extent we may have previously taken these for granted. I won't be taking it for granted again. Sometimes I have turned, uh, 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 you know, uh, going to the theatre down. I think I'm tired. I won't, I won't bother going. Actually, I'm not going to take that for granted again. I'm really looking forward to breathing the same air as the actors once more in a shared space at the same time. And with that, uh, I'd like to invite any questions or comments. Thank you for listening and for spending uh, your Monday evening with me. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was great. We have got some questions and uh, just to the audience, if you if you have any questions, please, um, in the on your dashboard, there is a question box. And uh, we've got about five minutes of questions now. So, Rob, if you're ready, I'll, I'll read the first one. Okay, I'll see what yeah, I can okay. do. <laughs> yeah, uh, just bear with me. They're quite lengthy. Uh, bearing in mind that the eye of the camera is always subjective, thanks to the camera's position, and the eye of the view is always guided to see, thanks to the editor or the vision mixer, do you feel that the overlap between theatre and media could damage the theatre experience or could it potentially help in the revival of the theatre post-COVID or as a result of it being more accessible to the public audience? 
That is a brilliant question with loads of parts. Um, I think that overlap, I think what the, the pandemic has really, really brought to a head is that we need to think what the differences and the similarities are between the mediums, if that makes sense. So for me, I don't, th I think the, where we have overlapped in the past, we don't quite understand what that overlap has done. And I think that by really trying to define what theatre is, which for me is about sharing space and time, and then trying to look at maybe potentially what, say, a film piece is, which is sharing time, I'm watching it in, in time, I'm sharing time or live cast, for example, in that sense, I can start to begin to understand what the theatrical um, nature of liveness is. So I think the pandemic has started to make us really answer these questions. But I do also agree with the earlier point, which is around the eye of the camera and the positions. And it's all it's all constructed, isn't it? Just as we construct an experience in the rehearsal room, no matter how free and playful that may be, you're still constructing an experience that you hand over. So the similarity is at the centre of this around a constructed experience, is something that's really useful um, to, to look at. But I don't think it will be damaged. I think it's making people want to crave to go back again personally as well. Um, uh, there's so much in that question that we could talk about that all night. Um, I don't know how many other questions we've got or shall we leave that one there and maybe come on to something else. I'm more than happy to pick up things after the event as well and chat with individual people uh, afterwards as well. Okay. Music has had this delightful issue of definitional justification for a long time. And the only thing that allows creators to define the thing as music is the fact that the creators define themselves as a composer of music. So question, are there not pieces where there is not a shared time of actor and audience, but the creators still call it theatre as they are theatre makers and actors? Should we read that, that, the question out again, Kitty, the second part? Yeah, of course, just bear with me. <laughs> are there not pieces where there is not a shared time of actor and audience but the creators still call it theatre as they are theatre makers and actors yes there are there are and i think that's what we're trying to battle with at the moment are we still theatre makers and i also think that this is related to how we rehearse, that we rehearse in a live environment. So we might be theatre makers, it may end up on a digital environment, on a digital platform, but we rehearse in a studio using theatrical techniques with theatre makers, and we understand that element of liveness. It may be captured once, um, but I certainly think that we can still call ourselves theatre makers. For example, the couple of the examples we saw earlier, they're still theatre makers, whether I define the end result as a piece of theatre is what I'm questioning, but certainly I think they uh, would still define themselves as theatre makers using verbatim theatre techniques, for example, looking at the uh, looking at a couple of the examples earlier. Thank you. Um, just uh, I don't have any more questions at the moment, Rob, but there's been some really lovely comments. Um, another comment here to say, not a question, but wanted to say thank you for this talk because it's really helped me have the hope that theatre will still be a thing post COVID. Well done for a wonderful presentation. I totally agree with the idea that theatre isn't recorded. It doesn't feel the same to watch a recording as a live performance. Um, lots of here, here, excellent talk, cracking talk. Thank you so much. I do think, Rob, that you've just given people a little bit of hope that, you know, we are going to have some normality and, and get back into the theatres. Oh, we will. We'll be back there. We, uh, you, we did between the lockdowns, didn't we? We'll be back. Absolutely. Um, oh, we have another question. Um, uh, if theatre means seeing, does it really matter how that happens? Yeah, uh, sorry, yes, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, and I think this is where we have to separate this idea of we see something, don't we, and we experience something um, versus theatre buildings themselves. Absolutely, it's still, it is, um, we, but I argue that we've, we've, because of the introduction of the digital realm uh, over the last century, we now need to, the etymological root means seeing, but I think we now to really need to battle what does it mean to see a theatrical experience on a screen? I think we need to un keep unpicking this. We need to talk about this as an industry we are doing. We need to talk about it more and we need to explore this 
it, it, at the university here, we, we need to set projects up and explore these questions because it has brought things to a head in a way which I think we've skirted, to be honest, we've skirted around the issue before. We haven't had this enforced closure for so long. So uh, let's keep exploring it. Okay, brilliant. We are out of time this evening, but thank you so much, Rob. Um, it's been a, a really great talk. Um, you can join us uh, for uh, more of the Profs in the Path Creativity's Contagious series. Please visit our um, events page at staffs.ac.uk uh, forward slash events for more of these talks. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. And I hope we'll see you all in the theatre soon. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much.